us and he knows there's still one person around here so he's going to try and find that one more person now is he looking looking for like a john deere tractor scent or <laughs> something from the farm that can help him identify dan uh you know what it, these dogs actually pick up on live human scent it's right. kind of one of those things you it's, we don't really understand but the dogs do it and uh it's uh, they identify each person these dogs only find live people also how long does it take to train one of these dogs it takes uh, probably about two years to train the dog and uh, it's a pretty intense about 2,000 hours uh, we look for dogs with high drive that have a lot of energy and and that really work hard and uh, you can see this dog's really, really searching hard. Unfortunately, the wind changed on us a little bit, and the dog's going to have to get right down on top of Dan before it identifies where he is. Okay, so there's the dog. Show us again, uh, if you don't mind, where Dan is in relation to the dog right now. Because Yeah, I think the she's, he, she, dog's got him now, so he's going to be right on top of him. Uh-oh, let's see. Don't say anything, Dan. And the dog will bark when he identifies where he is. Uh, doggy! <laughs> <laughs> The dog's trying to get inside to find him, and he's going to probably pull that out of there. And then wow! <laughs> so he so he knows somebody's in there. Yeah, I see the dog barking now. That, oh, what? look! He wants to help get Dan. He's trying to rescue Dan. The dogs will bark when they find people, and that's how we know where to come find them. So that was pretty quick. That's a gr what a great job, though. Yeah, the dog searched probably about, oh, I don't know, five, ten thousand feet of rubble in probably, what, about two minutes, three minutes? This might be a silly question, but, but when they're on the scene of an actual disaster, do you think they sense how important their job is? Do they get it, or are they, are they just, you know, trained to do something and they're just doing their job? You know, they're, they're very perceptive, and as anybody knows that has dogs or animals, they pick up on things, and this dog knows that when it's time to work and that the intenseness of the situation, and, uh, hey, there's Dan coming out now. Dan, you better give this dog a big hug because he could have left you in there for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, he said he likes dogs, so I think he'll probably give him a big old pet right there. That is great. Hey, give Dan the radio. There you go. How, how do you feel, D? Hey, big fella. Aww. Nice dog. You know what, Keith? This is why I'm a dog person. Can you imagine being buried like that and expecting a cat to come <laughs> find you? Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Thank you. It's not that I don't like cats, but you just explained my philosophy. Cow would have been like rubbing its neck up against some of the rubble. Somebody pet me purring. That was cool, Dan. That's a great dog, isn't it? Great dog, and it's so impressive what they do. Way to go, and thanks to the uh, fire departments for helping us with this. Glendale, Peoria, and yep. Phoenix, and I'll tell you what, if you were ever really buried there, ain't nothing better than the sound of a dog coming to your rescue. Oh, that's for sure. Thanks, you guys. Over the course of the last two and a half weeks, Arizona has not only been represented by several great athletes and great stories, but also an elite group of firefighters, medical technicians, and other rescue personnel who came here for a job they pray they'll never have to complete. We're coming down to get you. Hold on. Imagine this is a dorm in the Olympic Village or a crowded hotel in downtown Salt Lake City. And the unthinkable has happened. Going to a terrorist bomb has gone off, and people inside are trapped in the rubble. This elite group of Arizona firefighters and rescue personnel are used to sawing through concrete. They did it at the World Trade Center when they were called in for search and rescue. And now they're here praying these drills are the closest they'll come to a disaster at the Olympics. And here, you know, we, anything can happen. It can be a natural disaster. It can be a man-made disaster. It's just that if we anticipate it and we prepare for it, if something does occur, we can come together and take care of it. You wouldn't be human if you didn't get nervous about some things and stuff. Uh, but we're professionals, and, and uh, uh, who do you call if, uh, if we panic? But here, Arizona's best are not only dealing with the threat of terrorism, they're also trying to come to grips with the cold. We've had the best high-tech uh, long underwear, coats, gloves. Uh, we brought up about 70,000 pounds of equipment, and probably a bunch of that was cold weather clothing and gear. The Arizona unit that's here is considered among the best of the best, and although the work they're doing here and the training is deadly serious, there is a sense of competition and pride 
between the units. It's a real special feeling to be part of the uh, Salt Lake uh, Olympic 2000 watch. I think each and every member uh, is very proud to be from Phoenix, first of all, and then to be able to come here and support in the Olympic uh, involvement. And while they've enjoyed their experience, they're all ready to get back to some Arizona warmth. It's kind of like a summer camp, boys camp environment here, but I don't think we're going to be sitting around the fireplace or the fire singing uh, and being reminiscent when it's time to go. I think we'll be ready to go home. So will I. Not only was this uh, special group of Arizona firefighters called into service for the Olympics, one of only six groups in the nation, but they were also at the World Trade Center, as I mentioned, and Kent, you'll remember this, they were also on duty in Oklahoma City when we had the horrible tragedy there. So I think we can all be proud of these men and women. Guys, we'll toss it back to you and have more coming up in a couple of minutes. All right. Okay. They're very good at what they do. She is driven by a love of play. Her focus is unwavering. Her determination is absolute. And because of these qualities, one day she may very well save a human life. Kona and Steve Rochefort are members of the Arizona Search Dogs, a group of five Valley firefighters and their dogs trained to perform urban search and rescue missions throughout the country. Started over five years ago, this volunteer nonprofit organization is part of Arizona Task Force One, which is one of 28 federally authorized urban search and rescue teams nationwide. The task force is administered by the Phoenix Fire Department, and the search dogs and their handlers make a unique contribution to the team's efforts. It's amazing what type of work these dogs can do. Uh, you think of them as a, as a house pet, but their ability, their, their sense of smell is so phenomenal to think that you can bury somebody, let's say, in a two football field sizes of rubble and bury one victim and they can have that person located in, in five or ten minutes. Uh, it's, you know, it's, just, it's overwhelming to, to, to see them work and, and, and how they do it. Rochefort and his fellow handlers are able to conduct realistic training sessions at several Valley construction salvage yards. <laughs> These sessions are based on the dog's natural love of play and develop a finely honed ability for finding live disaster victims. The main thing is, is the toy drive. Go search. That's the reward that the dog gets when they find a victim buried in rubble. That dog wants to have that toy more than anything, more than life itself. And that's what makes a good search dog, is a dog that is willing to work and to search and to search for that toy. So if you can find a dog that wants to play and is full of energy and has a really good disposition, good girl. that's what's going to make a good search and rescue dog. Certain breeds have a natural affinity for this kind of work. Kona is a Belgian Malinois, a dog that is popular with police departments. Her fellow canines in the group are Labrador Retrievers, like Chance, who himself was rescued from a shelter just one day before his scheduled euthanasia. But luck and native ability can take a search dog only so far. We train three times a week at rubble sites throughout the valley. You have to work on obedience constantly. Stop. There's agility that you constantly Turn have around. to work on. Turn There's a difference between Stop. having kind of a, a good search and rescue dog and a really, really great search and rescue dog. And it comes down to hours. It also comes down to teamwork. During training sessions, members of the group take turns hiding from the dogs. Inexperienced animals are asked initially to find the victim in a practice barrel. They soon learn that success is rewarded with an opportunity to play. And as the dog's abilities develop, handlers move the game to a more realistic setting. Our dogs air scent on live victims. And there's only one way you're going to do that, and that's put each other in a hole and bury them with concrete and leave them there for a couple hours while the rest of us train. And you're not going to get many people to do that five years in a row every third day. I think we have an advantage in that we're all Valley firefighters. We've all known each other for a while, and it, it just tends, to, tends to, to make our group work better in that way. Arizona Search Dog members train from 800 to 1,000 hours a year to achieve the level of skill their job demands. In order to qualify for urban search and rescue missions, they must also meet the standards set by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which evaluates the dogs through a rigorous testing process. 
Because the conditions at disaster sites can pose a number of unknown risks for human members of the team, the dogs must also be trained to search independently of their handlers. There may be a structure that's untenable for us, whether collapse or just unsure. We can send them into that structure. They're lighter, they're more agile. They spread their weight out over four paws. They just seem to be able to do a lot better job getting in and out of those areas. We need to cover a very hazardous area, treacherous in terms of footing and, and things like that. The canines can do that faster than anything I've ever seen. And that's real important because when you have 40 members of a team waiting with specialized digging equipment, specialized cutting torches, ready to go, they want to dig, they want to rescue somebody. I've got to be able to tell them with a high probability this is where you need to spend your time and this is where you don't need to spend your time. I would not want to go out and try to clear three to five blocks with cameras and listening equipment. It would be slow, it would be frustrating, um, and it wouldn't be very accurate. I would not want to go out and do a search without the canines. The Arizona Search Dogs and Arizona Task Force One were deployed to New York following the disaster of 9-11 in support of search and rescue efforts at Ground Zero. While they were unable to find any live survivors, the dogs provided a valuable service nonetheless. Well, the dog's main goal is to find anybody that's trapped that we can't see that's alive. But in the event that there isn't anyone there to find, whether there's just no one there, no one is, is, is still alive, the dogs will go in and clear the area, and the comfort, the nice thing that it does for us is that when we pack up and leave and go to the next area, it's nice to know with, with a relative high degree of certainty that we haven't left anyone behind either. As the Arizona search dogs wait and train for their next deployment, the group remains busy with another kind of mission, one that's having a significant impact here at home. At the Phoenix Advantage Charter School, it's Search Dog Appreciation Day. On a previous visit, students learned about the dogs, their work, and how Chance, the black lab, was given a new life and occupation. The children were so impressed that one group of fourth graders decided to help. They collected um, food, uh, uh, dry food and canned food. They co collected toys. Um, actually, they had asked Captain Dean what they needed, and um, one of the things that the rescue dogs do work for is for toys, and so they were, the children were kind of uh, adamant about getting uh, toys so that they could be properly trained. And they also collected money donations, and uh, that worked out quite well. In appreciation of the students' generosity, Dogs and Handlers hosted a pizza party at the school where the donations were presented to another kind of rescue organization, the Desert Labrador Retriever Rescue, the group that saved Chance. Captain Dean explained that you know he was working with the school and that um, they were very impressed with Chance and he had told Chance's story about how he was almost put to death and been res resurrected as a working dog and an awesome working dog and he said because you've given chance to me and given us that opportunity we'd like